Yes, I got run over by a car last weekend. It's been quite a journey here. Is everything good? Microphone? And then uh, speaker sounds? All right, so that's up and running. Cool. So, let's start off by asking you guys a question. How many of us here have designed something in the last week? Can I see a few hands? Last month? Last year? Ah, that, that's actually not as bad as I thought. <laughs> so I teach design, and this is how I draw. You can laugh, it's pretty bad. I think I was trying to draw like the futuristic landscape of Chicago or something, and that's Lake Michigan on the left. And I think I see the architect over there frowning. So if someone like me can teach design, what the heck is design anyway? So like many of my generation, I started by asking the Pantheon of Human Knowledge, Wikipedia, for the definition. <laughs> and sure enough, the first thing it says, no generally accepted definition of design exists. All right, dead end there. Then I started sort of looking into the different things that we think about when we think of the word design, such as this $300,000 Lamborghini Musiago, or the Fritz Hansen egg lounge chair. But if you think about it, these are actually very modern creations of design, something maybe in the last 50 years or so. If you go back, dial it back a little bit uh, back then, what were the first things that we were designing? When you start looking into those objects, you see something very different, such as this uh, lower Paleolithic hand axe from about 500,000 years ago, or this Jomon pot. I mean, this was only 7,000 years ago in Japan, so it's kind of like the iPad of the Stone Ages. <laughs> and when you start sort of looking at these objects, you start to get a very different picture of design or what we were doing back then such as when these sort of ferocious predators came after us, we humans actually didn't stay as prey forever. We instead designed weapons to deal with these animals. We probably are the first ones to ever climb the food chain. And we turned those ferocious animals into spaghetti pasta for dinner, and we didn't want to get our hands dirty, we uh, designed silverware to eat it very cleanly. And at the end of a nice soiree, when you had all the dishes piling up with all your friends and you didn't really want to clean it, we designed dishwashers. And after all that's done and you wanted to clean your garden while enjoying your wine but using your hands, otherwise you could get the wine glass holder necklace, two for $24.95. This is an actual product they sell on the market. And it's not just products that we design, it's also the services we design, such as this, what the sushi chef is doing for his customers. So I'm not much for definitions, but when I was traveling over the summer in Switzerland, I took this picture. I'm not sure if you can kind of tell from this, but it's actually a bunch of kids sitting around having a picnic, and they were cooling their beer in one of these many water fountains that are all around the city. And I was just thinking to myself when I saw this, man, these kids would actually make really good designers. Then it hit me, design is what we do to accomplish the things we want. And that was really clear to me. Compare that to sort of what I saw a year ago in my hometown of Kyoto, which was this, that's design. I was really confused after this one because I had no clue what a foot and a ball had to do with design. <laughs> So some sort of the iconic objects that come to mind, the, the things that come to our mind when we think of the word design, what actually are they? Well, are you, I would argue that they're actually a specific form of design called industrial design. And they really came right after industrialization <laughs> in the history of mankind, when we could actually start replicating objects or producing objects and the exact copy so that no longer the guy sitting on the factory or the guy who's making the final object is the one who's deciding what the shape should look like. And they were, the industrial designers were the ones who came to answer the question, well, in a world of perfectly replicable objects, what should objects look like? Design, on the other hand, is probably what we've been, what we've been doing for a long time, and I would say maybe what separates us from the animals. So if design's been going on for a long time, why all this buzz around design now? Well, I would say that it's because designing used to be easy. I mean, if this 10-year-old kid in Bangladesh can spin a lathe, anyone can design, right? Okay, that's actually not what I mean, but if you... Look back about 60 to 100 years ago, sort of the paradigm changing or the iconic products of the time, the automobile, the television, the refrigerator, they're technically and technologically complex, but they're actually fairly simple in the inter interaction with the people they had. Maybe the most complicated object here is the television, but even then you go to a store, buy it, get it delivered to your home, you plug it into the wall, maybe you tweak with the antenna a little bit, you put on the power, and voila, it works. Compare that to the sort of the three paradigm changing products of the last 10 to 20 years. The personal computer, the smartphone, and the internet. Not only are they technologically complex, but they're also very complex in interaction with the people. And as a result, you get things like this. Now you guys are laughing because some of you have already seen this video before. 
Do we have sound? There you go. All right. So this is a video that went viral oh, maybe six to eight years ago. Now, we're all laughing right now, but I want you to take a slightly different perspective. There was one, or if not, a lot of designers behind that computer who was trying to create an object that was going to make that guy's life better. There was clearly an epic design fail right there. And all the iconic projects, products of 60 to 100 years ago, now they are also becoming increasingly complex as well. Take, for example, the Nissan GTR here. This probably has more buttons than nuclear power plants now. And it has probably the computing power of the first space shuttles that went into, or spacecrafts that went into space, or into the moon. Now your refrigerator can come with two different screens that can show pictures of your most recent vacation. Another reason why design is becoming more important is globalization. This is the organizational map of Daimler Chrysler, when I used to work, when, back when it was Daimler Chrysler. And you can see here that we basically had offices, oh, that's actually hard to see, we actually had offices in every single continent except Antarctica. And because of globalization and international commerce, we're getting to this interesting point where the designer, manufacturer, marketer, and the end user can come from different corners of the world in completely different contexts. And the understanding of people is becoming more and more important. Also as a result of the increased productivity through globalization and international commerce, we can do things like this now, where we can put out products really fast, stock supermarket shelves at an incredible pace for the end consumer. Yet we're also hitting this weird paradox or problem where new products now have a 48% failure rate. Was this used to be the case back in the Middle Ages, back when we lived in villages like this? I would argue no, because chances are, back in the day when people were designing products, they actually lived next to the people who were using the products. If not, they were the users themselves. And when you're a designer then, well, you create your product, you take it next door, you show it to the guy who's potentially your buyer, and chances are the guy will give you feedback like, that works, that doesn't make sense, this is probably really useless. And then you take it back and start improving on it. Now, over the last hundred years, we've gotten incredibly richer and incredibly more productive. This is actually data for the United States after World War II. And you can already see that the real GDP per capita has gone up by threefolds over the last about 60 years. We also hit this interesting paradox where we're not getting any happier because of it. Uh, people call this the development paradox. What's more disturbing is this map I discovered browsing through the internet on, from a Japanese researcher who put together some World Health Organization data together. And what this map shows, the pink areas and especially, are the areas or the countries where there are more suicides than murders. And chances are you come from a country where there are actually more suicides than murders. But did you know that? And the num number is actually increasing as well. The World Health Organization now estimates that in any given year, there's about one million suicides per year. What are we doing creating a world that we actually don't want to even live in? So what am I doing? I'm part of two movements. One is the design thinking movement, the movement to bring design to the forefront with everything we do again. And I'm also part of another movement called a D-School movement, which is trying to teach or trying to create places where people can actually learn and experience this design thinking. And these are some of the schools I had the opportunity to work with uh, over the last few years. And you can see the school I work for in the middle in Paris right there. And this isn't the only schools working on it. Bruce Nussbaum of uh, Business Week has been writing about design thinking for a long time, and he's actually cataloged all the programs in the world that are sort of doing this kind of activity. And these aren't your normal schools either. This is sort of what a classroom could look like. They're kind of platforms for people from different disciplines to come together and work on new innovation projects, trying to come up with new ideas. This is what a classroom could look like. This is the ME310 loft at Stanford University. This is sort of where I learned. And this is actually a teaching session between the professors and the students now. This is the space we were building with the students in Paris. The students actually went to IKEA and bought the furniture themselves and assembled it, which is great because they're also the end users of the space. So in a way, they're kind of learning design by also designing their own space. Now, I keep talking about design as this sort of maybe new discipline, something that goes alongside business, education, engineering, or law. But design itself is actually more of a holistic discipline or synthetic where it's sort of an intersection of all these disciplines that come together to ultimately create value for people. And as a result, uh, many of the D schools that I talk about actually don't even have students in their own, well, it's not even a department, they don't have students in the school themselves. So they actually take students from different places or faculty from different places and create a platform for it where they can work together. 
And these ideas that come out of D-School hasn't stopped at the, hedge, or at the ends of the academic hedges either. For example, at Stanford, there are actually many companies that came out of the D-School. One's D-Light, which is a solar-powered lighting alternative for um, the Southeast Asian market or the Southern Asian market to replace kerosene lamps. And this started uh, from a class called Design for Extreme Affordability or Design for the Developing World, where the students actually went to these countries to do a field study before coming up with these ideas. Another one you may have heard of is the iPad app, Pulse. It's a news aggregator app that was number one iPad app for a while. And Steve Jobs actually demonstrated it in one of his keynotes. And this, ironically, started from a class called Launchpad at Stanford, which is all about starting uh, new companies. And the cool thing about this was that the guys who created this didn't have an office, so they ended up sitting in one of the cafe outside of Stanford University. While developing the software, they were actually also showing their users what they were developing. and had this very tight loop of user testing and developing going on at the same time. So in trying to explain what I do, I'd like to quote my mentor and professor at Stanford University, Dr. Larry Leifer. It is our mission to design the environment, context, and resources that students need to learn from reality and be creative innovators. We're not just teachers, we're also designers as well. But enough about what I'm doing. I want to take this back to you guys. So recently at TEDx Berkeley, Fred Dust, from, uh, a partner from IDEO in Palo Alto, said that the world needs a lot more designers in the coming years. I tend to agree with him, but I also believe that everyone in the world needs to be a designer as well and get better at it. So in the name of audience participation and trying to get you guys to become more designerly, I want to launch the TEDx NHH Design Challenge. So everyone, please look under your seats. There should be something taped under your chair. So what you're seeing there is the instruction to your design challenge and a little gift thanks to the organizers from TEDx NHH which is apparently candy from Lithuania, very exotic. So that, that's a gift to anyone who actually completes the challenge. A little motivation there. So the instructions are on there. Let's go through it step by step here. So first step, find someone to design for. This could be your friend, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your husband, your wife, or a group of people who you think are very, very sort of underserved by existing products, services, or designs. And the reason for doing this is because ultimately what you design should bring value to people. It shouldn't just exist in sort of an open air. Next step, interview, observe, empathize. Engage with your users, engage with the people you're trying to design for, and really, really try to understand what their world is like. Don't try to project your own world onto them, but get a picture of their world. And ultimately, what you design or what you create has to fit in their world, and this is sort of the step to make sure. Third step, define what you want to accomplish or focus. Chances are when you sort of go out and do these interviews or observations, you have a lot of these small little data points or small little observations. This is about sort of putting it together and making a big picture out of it. When Apple first uh, created their iPod and iTunes system, they weren't trying to create a music player with a scroll wheel or a certain size screen and a five gigabyte hard disk. No, they were trying to create the best damn music experience possible. Next step. Ideate. Try to come up with as many ideas as possible. And don't be scared of coming up with crazy, wacky, or wild ideas because chances are the best ideas that you come up with are going to be right next to those crazy ideas. And lastly, prototype and test. Once you have those ideas, start expressing some of them. Start making them tangible as possible so that you can actually take it back to your user and get feedback. And there you'll start to see what the gap between what you were thinking and what they wanted. And there you can take it back and start improving upon your design again. A classmate of mine once famously said, design is never done, it's just you. And what's important here is not that you go through these process uh, sequentially, one, two, three, four, five, and call it done, but it's actually to go back and keep repeating some of the steps where you think is actually necessary. It's not the order that matters as much, it's more the fact that you actually do all these steps at one point or another. So what I gave here to you guys is actually sort of the intro introductory pack or sort of the dim sum or the sampler pack to design thinking. There's very much a very deep um, art and science to what we do. And it's a little, obviously 18 minutes is not enough to sort of introduce you to this, but if you're interested, Stanford D School has actually put out the design thinking method guide, which is available to the public online on their blog. 
And behind the uh, instruction sheet, there's actually the web address you can look up to actually get to this material. And lastly, since we live in a world of social everything, if you do want to share your design, here's a Twitter hashtag you can use, also written on your instruction sheet. And if you'd rather stay anonymous or don't use Twitter, feel free to send it into everyonedesigner at gmail.com, and we will try to get it up online one way, shape, or form or another. Fair warning, this, is, this activity is very much a prototype for myself, so I don't know how it's going to scale. If everyone here sends me an email, it's going to take me a while. So in closing, in the last 100 years, we've created a pretty incredible world with all the technologies we created, all the capabilities we developed. But to a certain extent, I think we started losing sight of what's really important when the technologies, the capabilities, and the production have become more important than us, them, us ourselves. And I think we're starting to lose sight of what is actually really important to us and what we want and what we need. So what the heck is design thinking anyway? It's taking design back into everything that we do. And we all need to be designers. And we all need to get better at it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sushi. I present to you the umbrella. Awesome. Thank you very much. <laughs>